leading up to this conversation, we've we've already exchanged a few thoughts about writing. And I'd like to ask you more about one thing you said to me, which was, I've been thinking about the many ways in which silence has played a part in my life, especially in the lives of women I know. I think that my job as a writer is to sit with silence and to urge it outwards into voice. And I'd, I'd love to hear more on that thought. Yeah, you know, when, when you asked me that over our email exchange, I really had to think about it. Um, when you asked me about speaking more about silence, I almost shut down immediately. I was like, oh, what can I say? Because <laughs> it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. I think silence in my own life has been really positive and renewing. Like I spend a lot of time alone. Um, I need a lot of time alone. But I know that the silence in the lives of the women of my family, especially, hasn't been the same. It's kind of a different kind of silence. And it has to do more with... Um, with shame and historical and patriarchal oppression and erasure. And I feel like it's my responsibility to, to my ancestors and myself to give voice to that silence because I feel like breaking it in some way is going to heal me and the ancestral sort of trauma and pain that's in my body. I've been thinking a lot about healing too and how breaking silence can be a kind of healing. What about you? Well, I think that's quite profound what, what you're saying about silence. And I recognize, too, that it can have those you know, different qualities to it, a sense of being silenced, of something that's actually needing to be said that hasn't been or um, can't be safely said or is, is repressed. And on the other hand, the, the gift of a silence that feels safe and renewing and place where I think writing-wise we can come to hear a voice that, that might be the writing voice inside of us, mm -hmm. that silence is also necessary for, for that. So how do you practice that, like in your, own, in your own life? How do you sort of cultivate that kind of inner voice that arises from the silence? I have to say that in that sense, my writing feels very colored by parenting over the past 10 years. So... Mm -hmm. um, that kind of silence has been a precious commodity. It's been relatively rare. And so, yeah, it's something that I try. I seek it out when I can. I go for walks. I do have, I do have my own room for writing. I have the, the room of my own and doesn't have a lock, but it's, it's good enough. And I'm really fortunate for that. So it's also a place I can go to do that work. But I've learned to take what comes, like the small the small, short instances of intervals of silence and to sometimes yeah, kind of curl into them even when they don't feel like they're going to amount to much because they're what they're, it's what there is. And so it's, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure my writing would be different if that wasn't the case. But I don't mind that we all have forces in our lives that shape what we're able to make and how. And so that's, that's part of what generates my current projects or my voice is that there isn't there isn't really that much silence in my life I suppose mm -hmm. yeah how about yourself yeah I find it really difficult too um I live alone but I feel like I've I work really hard to maintain living alone especially in Vancouver the rents are so high so it's pretty difficult to mm -hmm. find a a small space to stay alone um mm -hmm. but yeah I definitely say it's it makes me feel like an outsider in a way because I I cherish silence so much. It's like I'm constantly just trying to save my save whatever silence I have in my life. And sometimes people get offended when my boundaries are too strict, or you know, sometimes people don't understand why I want to be alone so much. Or <laughs> yeah, I, I think I hide it sometimes because I want to. It's so precious to me. Mm. Um, and I'm constantly struggling to find it too. Like I, I take on so much work to have this place to stay alone, but then, you know, also have to like consciously meditate, consciously go for a walk just to cultivate that voice for the, for the poems and for the novel. And especially right now, I feel like I'm really struggling because the, the, no, I'm writing the novel through poems. So I'll write a poem and it'll be a scene for the novel, but I constantly have to stay steeped in the, in the images or I'll lose it if I come up to into the world too much and start to do too many things. So I'm constantly trying to keep it. Huh. 
So you're building a whole sort of alternate dwelling place almost for yourself with the project. Yeah, I'm really trying. And I feel the novel is really testing that for me. With poems, I feel like I can I can have brief spaces of silence, like about half an hour or even at night. And I can write a poem or write some, write a draft of a poem or something. Yes. But with the novel, I find I really have to sustain it. Right. It's been challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And how does... How does that silence relate to the one that isn't voluntary? I mean, do you start mm-hmm. to hear those voices that you alluded to that might be ancestral or, or have to do with women in your family and around you? Do you how do they come to you and how, how do you start to translate their silence into words? Yeah, I find that that's such a good question. And I'm so glad you asked me that because I was trying to articulate how exactly I, I I guess I feel like I receive like images and voices and that might sound you're a poet so you'll understand but that might sound a little you know crazy to other people (laughs) but it's just that the more quiet I am the more I can pay attention to sort of these like stray or random images that'll come to me and they're almost always connected to my past I guess because I've been reading so much about it and trying to talk to my family about it so much and so I think I've become more attentive to them and started honoring them as opposed to letting them pass and I've only been able to do that since I've started to sustain the silence for the novel that doesn't sound crazy to me at all (laughs) (laughs) I mean I culturally I think we like we tend to kind of easily accept that that physically we're made of our parents and their you know, the generations going back, we have their biology and, and genetic material and the cells have been passed on. But I think I think that's also so true of our less material parts of the spirit or what, what we might want to call it. And so the idea that images or voices are coming to you through that channel, I feel is very natural. And I can relate to, to the idea of of needing to pay attention and and listen to them and give them voice in some way. And Mm -hmm. part of what you're saying makes me look forward to, and there might be periods in my life where, um, yeah, where parenting isn't quite so, um, so hands-on anymore. And then it'll be interesting to see what comes in a, in a longer interval of concentration. But um, I also hear what you're saying that it can be challenging to combine that with Mm -hmm. real world living and to sustain that, that place that you're going to for yourself. Yeah. 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 To, it can seem selfish to people outside of, outside of yourself, but, but how I'm curious about your process though. Like, do you also work with the voice in poetry or do you come to images first? How does that, how is it for you? I do tend to um, to have worked mostly with poems that start sonically. I find a phrase will come to me often, and um, mm-hmm. it's like a, it'll be a phrase or a few words that have a certain sort of charge around them that I know I want I want to write a poem with them, and and I go from there. And so often, even the outward movement from that single phrase tends to be on a bit of a sonic basis that the way it sounds is the way that it echoes out into the rest of the the poem's structure. Wow. So having said that, in what I'm now working on um, is a project poetry-wise that doesn't do that because, of course, I think as writers, we're also often just curious to push ourselves or to see what happens if we... Um, if we vary our usual approach. And so in this case, it's, it's a project that's very much looking at and, and thinking of um, having a mixed background. And so I'm talking about two places called the mother country and the father country, which are uh, partly geographically real and partly imaginary. But with those two prompts, I am working with images more. As you say, I just go to each of those places and try to imagine them more and more fully and to to start working with their tensions and interactions and so it's not it's not that approach I've had in the past of Mm -hmm. of waiting to sort of hear a phrase like that in my mind right right I'm so I'm so curious about how this um 
how it how your how you conceptualize it in terms of mother country and father country. So does that also have to do with parentage, but also land? Like, do you have actual places that you're thinking about as the countries that you're then transposing into these imaginary sites? Yes, that's right. So it's both. And it's also, um, I mean, the way we originate differently from our mothers and our father's bodies, right? All of that mm. um, is in, in the, the relational aspects between daughters and parents, between myself and my parents. But I, I um, yeah, it, it's also the countries of my mother's country of origin is the Netherlands and my father's is Kenya. But at the same time, what you and I've also talked about briefly earlier is mm. even even my father's country is a sort of um, is a notion that's easy to fragment once again because he his family came from Pakistan and Afghanistan and of course Pakistan didn't even exist geographically when his right, right. great grandparents came over from there and so there are all sorts of ways that the idea breaks breaks into not just pieces, but but currents, I would say, sort of currents that, that spread out from each other. And, and mm-hmm. I think that impossibility of naming a single place and, make, you know, the fact that it becomes kind of prismatic mm-hmm. in nature is part of what I'm interested in. Oh, that's so beautiful. So well said. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's always nice to hear really early encouragement. So I appreciate yeah. that. And you're one of the few people I've found who was also mixed and who also has similar trajectories in my life. You know, my dad's family is from from Kenya too, from the coast. Oh yeah. And so they're twice displaced as well. Like India and Pakistan weren't in existence when his ancestors moved to Kenya. So it's so I and and I feel that the nuance gets lost, you know, the nuances of the of the identities of my my dad's ancestors and the more distant ancestors it gets lost once once we come once we've settled elsewhere and I'm really interested in what it would look like to try to bring that nuance back yeah exactly those relationships are so complex and it's part of also why it's been so great for me to make this connection with you because I think we both recognize that it's it's rare to embody that background yeah and in this country and um yeah, it's really meaningful for me to to hear someone else talk about it too and to see it come up in your work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found uh, I was in Victoria over the weekend and I went to Russell Books and I was so surprised to find a novel by Abdul Razak Gurna, who's a British um, Kenyan writer. Right, yeah. And the novel is very much about uh, just the mixed families and the secrecy that can come from being mixed in places like Kenya or like South Asian families in Kenya um, and African families, South Asian African families in Kenya and just the secrecy and the taboo that uh, it sort of takes on after generations down the line, that silence sort of builds. So That's fascinating. I, w- I want to look for that because I, I know I've read another book of his that I really loved, but I don't know that one. Oh, but, um, nice. Yeah, I can. That's that's very much um, a narrative current in in my own family, and it's almost as if there are layers to to colonialism and to decolonialism that don't even come up in in conversation here locally so much because we're focused on the white. Yeah well, white, indigenous, white, brown, white, black divides, all of those. But even, you know, in in Kenya, there are a whole other strata of oppression and of inherent worth that were created by colonialism among mm-hmm. uh, and between people who aren't white. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I feel, you know, when people especially talk about things like British India, it's almost seen as this, like, bygone era yeah. of, like, things that are no longer in existence. But the more I've been working on the new poems and the more I talk to people like you, it just feels like it's it's so present in my life. You know, the, the history of empire, it's essentially shaped the entire way my family's moved across the world and the places that we've ended up in. So it's still so present. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I don't know if it's if this is the case within your family as well, but I find, I mean, there's also 
in a certain generation, there can be a reverence for that colonial power. Mm. And it's not, it's not under, you know, purely reverence. I don't mean that, but, but there's a sense of both in my family, a recognition of, of its problematic nature, but on a very much more personal level, and still a lot of internalized senses of the, the British golden standard. Yeah. And that is, also so complex to work with and in a way I think we might be one of the first generations to be able to really safely critique that and un- undo it in ourselves to the greatest extent possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah so well said I definitely have seen that that kind of reverence of like Naipaul's generation you know Naipaul has this reverence right. for England too and so much of his work and my my on my mom's side my grandpa too who's mixed uh, Irish and South Asian and Persian. Yes, and so he had a he had a lot of reverence for the empire, and it came through in the way my mom speaks about him, and the way that she spoke to me about England, and even about Canada. So that's very interesting. And is that um, I don't I don't want to draw you out on a work in progress that you you only have to say what you're ready to say. But is how does the novel look at those questions in some way yeah I'm struggling with it I'm hoping that the poems will open (laughs) will open something uh will open a way for me to speak about that without sounding too uh grating like too judgmental right now I feel like I'm at a really raw place where I'm struggling to understand um but I'm trying to move myself towards this like nuanced understanding of how somebody could feel that way at that time and why they might feel that way so it's a lot of research, actually. That can be a hard leap to make when it seems there seems we have the sense of moral clarity about the situation now, in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you were saying like our generation is probably the you know we have a good vantage point to critique it, and I feel very much that that's very true that we're situated in a good spot to critique it. So I feel so strongly about that. It's difficult for me to imagine the other side. So that's. That's my challenge that I'm setting up for myself right now, and it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, I can I can really imagine that. And is travel part of the research for you? Um, luckily, when I when the when Port of Bean came out, I ended up going to Dublin to read at a conference there, and that unlocked so much of um, the historical research I was doing. It just ended up being very coincidental that. Uh, the family was rooted there on my mom's side and so I guess I did traveling one before COVID when I could (laughs) yeah but I've never been to like India or Pakistan or Iran and I don't think I can go there to be honest until it's a little bit more safe have you have you done traveling to the Netherlands and and to South Asia and Kenya well no I have not been to South Asia though I would I would love to someday Um, but I have the Netherlands is is the country we physically emigrated from to Canada. And so I've been back there the most over the years, not, not regularly in the last two decades, but before that, when my, my grandparents were alive, we would go fairly every, every one to two years for a little while. So I know, I know the Netherlands well. Kenya is uh, a little more of a, a sense memory almost. I think I was seven the last time we were there. Oh, wow. What do you remember, if I can ask? Well, interestingly, I remember quite a lot. And I I don't know, I'm not sure what to make of that as far as the amount of detail that I do hold, but except that I think it must have been a really, a good feeling place to be, you know, that there was a sense of soaking in lots of experiences. Um, Yeah, so we we lived there twice in that time when I was a young kid. And with with my father's extended family, mm. and so I do. I remember that period fairly well, and I also remember the return to the Netherlands. And now I had certain small habits that were heavily critiqued when I started going to school in that culture. Um, in the one that stands out for me is smiling too much. That mm. I was. Uh, I guess I. I that part of Dutch culture is you don't, you don't smile unless you have a good reason. (laughs) And um, in Kenya, that's not so much the case. And I, um, I think I had sort of 
taken on the the friendliness of being out in the street and just a smile being kind of a a default way to greet strangers and so yeah I remember small corrections made like that to my bearing after we did come back from Mm. Kenya and wow that's so fascinating I haven't thought about that but it's it's so true um and how did how do you think those corrections were felt or were made I think yeah that's a great question I I feel that they they feed right into to the tropes that sort of make up racism or forms of it, right? Because I think the association, for example, with smiling for no reason was that I maybe I was kind of daft, you know, I wasn't I wasn't all there because I was in this state of baseline happiness or something that wasn't mm-hmm. right. And so I think I remember feeling feeling that, feeling that edge of judgment around it that we're not just trying to ask you to fit in but we're warning you that this is not what what sanity looks like to us you know right. I mean it's that's a, that's obviously not how seven-year-old girls spelled it out but I remember yeah I remember that feeling about it and that I learned mm-hmm. I learned over the months and maybe that year to to hold it in and to be grimmer mm-hmm. and it's fascinating to me that that's that whole unfolding of what part of you becomes dominant because is you know what part of you is permissible is is so dependent on place and culture yeah it's like almost in a, in a way the place has rewritten your body and your expression yeah exactly that's so fascinating that's ex- that's a really good good phrase for it yeah and we're talking about um you well you mentioned very briefly the title of your book port of being which I think is so beautiful and I wanted to ask you about the about the title and about port cities in general you're living in one in Vancouver but tell me more about how that plays into your work you know to be honest even though I I wrote a book called Port of Being (laughs) I didn't really concretize ports too much there were just always place places ports were always just something that I felt drawn to constantly yeah and only after writing my book I realized that my parents and my grandparents and my ancestors all lived in port cities like Bombay, Bandar Abbas in South Iran and Mombasa and Zanzibar. So everything's always been a port. Mm. And, and even when I visit any country, I always go to the port if I'm feeling kind of like I want to feel at home. It's just so strange. Like it's, you know, ports are spaces of movement and transience. So it's like, what does it mean for that kind of place to feel like home? I I still don't know, but I, it's something I'm constantly drawn to. I think that's fascinating. And I wonder then if I can relate to that feeling very much. I love cities like Rotterdam or, um, yeah, as you said, I mean, Mombasa was a very long time ago, but ports are, they, they're, they are fascinating. And I wonder, I wonder if in some way they're more likely to come up in diasporic origins, you know, in our histories. Yeah. We, because the the rest of the world, in a sense, is is within reach, is right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there are spaces of intersection for sure. You know, where so many cultures, you know, mix and merge. And I think it, the ports probably explain my identity, <laughs> which is you know, most as a Muslim woman of Indian, Pakistani, Persian, and Irish descent, and everybody came from a port. <laughs> so I think there's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and even linguistically, like the whole Swahili language was, yeah, um, it was a a slow merger that happened because of trade and and seafaring and yeah, that's so true. Yeah, there's uh, so many words in Swahili that are also in Urdu and also in Arabic. Right, they're like interchangeable words. Yeah, yeah. How do you your new book, um, Alphabet Alphabet? Is that how have you been working with language in that? Because it's very much about language, right? So have you been like looking at etymologies or? Yes. So the book is has that title because it consists of 26 little essays. So there's one for each letter of the alphabet. Oh. And yeah, partly I did that because I really wanted to have the opportunity to go in as many directions as possible because that's what I realized when I started to think about language. Um in that essay form and and work on things that it really is so multifaceted for me, my relationship to Dutch and then to my father's 
languages as well. And so, um, yeah, there are sections that are very anecdotal and deal with with my emotional connection to to Dutch, the way it feels maternal to me, partly because my mother mm. spoke it, partly because that's the language of my early childhood. And then also um, a question, like, how does Dutch sound to English speakers? I surveyed my friends and had them all listen to a certain little clip of Dutch and asked them to describe it in a few words. So trying to feel out, like, what am I speaking? What is it? What does it mean to to outsiders? Yeah. Um, who would I? That's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I, I guess going back to that idea of the what you said about rewriting is it rewriting the body based on where you are based on place like a, when we talked about smiling mm-hmm. so language I think also has that that potential effect on us to almost rewrite who we are depending on which language we we inhabit or languages and that um I mean, within Canada and, and cities like Toronto and Vancouver, I think I think that's just one of the most fascinating things is that that's such a widespread experience to to draw on multiple languages in your life, and also that each of us does that in some way uniquely and privately. You know that mm-hmm. this is the language for our grandparents, and this is the language for work, or and um, that the book was really humbling in that way because in a way it's, it's this delving into my own experience. And it is that it's a memoir in that sense, but it's also, it just made me, it makes me feel very connected to others that so many people in Canada are having that experience in some form or another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Multilingual experience. And how would you say, how did you come to it, the form of the essay as opposed to poetry? Did you know right away that it was going to be essays instead? Right. Um, yes, to some extent. So the reason was that when, when my first book came out, Leaving Howe Island, I was asked in a couple of interviews how Dutch had influenced the poems. And because I had used a few um, Dutch words mm-hmm. in some of them, there were people suggesting that they could hear the Dutch sort of throughout the English and that it was in trying to answer those questions um, in conversation that I realized how inadequate my answer felt, that I was just sort of on the surface of something much bigger that basically needed to be book length. And so I started, I started writing down for myself those thoughts about it. And because yeah, I just kept a notebook for a year or two um, every time that I thought of some aspect of the way language worked for me or how it showed up in my life, the Dutch language, I would I would make a note of it. Mm. And I read around, around the subject. And so I think it was the nature of those notes. Like they weren't, they weren't those little bits of sonic mm-hmm. uh, input that I associate with writing a poem. You know, it was thought and thought for me is more is more prose. Yeah. Mm. And so do you regularly keep notebooks as part of your writing practice and like observe yourself and sort of take actively look at yourself and listen to yourself? Or was it, was it specifically for this project that you were working in this way? Yeah, no, I do. I I have notebooks all and I wish it was more consistently one clearly designated notebook but yeah you as well is that right yeah yeah Yeah. I always wish I was more methodical about it yeah um what I do these days is I have um a few you know those they're they're like an older style of stand-up folder where you can put magazines in them like cardboard and um Mm -hmm. they I use one for each writing project now and so I tend to, if if a notebook happens to have too many cross sections of different projects, I can like separate the pages. And also, if I come across any images or interviews or things that seem to really speak to the project, then often I just um, yeah, I just physically put them in that box, and that also feels like 
something I can do when when things are busy or elsewhere in life and then return to without feeling like the momentum's totally broken. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I feel like it makes such a difference to have like a concrete thing that you can hold for collecting all the thoughts because it makes it feel like there's actually something there, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's different from a computer file. Yeah. I was listening to this uh, po- a f- podcast called A Phone Call with Paul, and he interviewed um, Lewis Hyde, who wrote this like popular book called The Gift about creativity. But he was talking about Lewis Hyde's uh, new book. But Lewis Hyde was talking about his notebook process and how the entire book arose out of those notebooks. And so he's actually formatted his new book, uh, the way that he organized his notebooks for collecting all the thoughts about the topics that he was writing about. And after I heard that podcast, I thought, I really want to be methodical about the notebooks because before everything was just going in one and I have to, I started numbering the pages and trying to organize it with highlights, but it just got messier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should try your folder technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be interested in seeing that new, that new hide book. Yeah. And I'm thinking too of um, the poet Phil Hall and how he, I, I've heard him mention that all his all his poetic lines come from his notebooks that they are the that it's basically a matter of assembly almost after mm-hmm. after he keeps meticulous notes yeah yeah poets are in a way i think people who catalog like i remember when i was young i used to make lists obsessively mm-hmm. and i didn't know at the time you know what a poet was or what what it even meant but that list making sort of impulse is still very much a part of part of what I do do you make lists too that's very interesting other than to-do lists I don't think I really do no (laughs) but I that's funny I I you made me remember of um a moment when I was in grade school when um I've been sitting in class and I I made a list of every student every student's name and then after their name I just wrote down like a short description a few adjectives or something about who I thought they were in a book, like whether like something about their characterization or personality and who they oh. would be. And, and then when I was done, I sat there and I realized I had like an incredibly damning document in my hands, basically that if anyone found it, I would be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I destroyed it. <laughs> oh my God. But, How but, old were you? I think I was grade three or so. Yeah, oh my god, early, that's early young. version of a list. <laughs> Deviance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I did myself. Speaking of, it's hard to be objective on your on yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is very hard. Yeah. I, you also just made me remember something too. When I was young, now I should tell you because it's a deviant memory as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was at mosque, when I was uh, really young, I used to get bored, and all the elderly ladies used to sit in the same row in the same uh, arrangement. And so I made a list of of all the ladies and what they would wear, and then I oh. would go around underneath the chairs at mosque while prayers were going on and make a yes. note of which one had the smelliest feet. <laughs> <laughs> that was only five or something like that. But. <laughs> That was definitely a poetry moment. (laughs) That's amazing. Somewhere there's a unit of measurement or a scale for that. Right. If not, you invented it. (laughs) The smelly feet index. Exactly. (laughs) I I wonder, too, um, with, with my latest book with alphabet alphabet I had the experience of um having my both my parents are still alive and they they read the work and um I think that was less uh the case when it was poetry and that they love to read but I think I think prose was just more accessible to them and um Mm -hmm. and a lot of it as as we touched on earlier is is almost a kind of reckoning with the contradictions of of some of my past and, and with the postures towards language and ethnicity and identity that, that we inhabit in my family. And so it was, um, there was a certain sense of risk as like writerly and personal risk to making that part of our family conversation. 
and I was very fortunate that it went really beautifully. But I wondered if that's something you come up against mm -hmm. in your work, and does it ever serve as a silencing power to you, that sense of family? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's such a such a good conversation and such a good question too. Um, you know, my first book when Port of Bean came out, I hadn't really told my parents about the extent of my addiction. Like I hadn't really told anyone. Right. Um, and when it came out, I didn't know what to expect. Like they found out through the CBC interview that I did about the book, um, oh. and I was prepared for the worst, but. Luckily, it didn't go bad, you know. They they accepted me and they loved me. And now I, I visit them far more often than I used to. Like, I almost feel like the book has allowed me to rebuild my relationships with my family. It's kind of, like, brought me back into the world. So I think breaking the silence about it was so good, so good in so many ways. But I never could have done it just one-on-one -on -one through, through talking, you know. I think that's fascinating because when we <clears throat> said earlier – that our generation might be among the first to to sort of safely examine and critique what happened and that both of us are interested in voicing um, things that come come to us through through our ancestors. Yeah, I wonder if there's also then that potential for it to serve as a healing substance in some way within the family. I mean, I don't, I imagine neither of us wrote for that purpose when you described being expecting the worst. And I felt a bit similarly when I, when I sent my, my project to my parents, but I, I wonder if that those silences, no one was really comfortable in them. I imagine, right. Even, even at the time and to start speaking when that possibility has come to us, it feels it feels like that there might be a relief for mm -hmm. the generations who had to live with the silence and through the silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in a way it's um it kind of starts to shape who you write for. I feel like my first book was very much just written for me. Mm. And and maybe for people who had been been through similar experiences like addiction especially, but afterwards I, it kind of broke broke my very small world and brought me back into the world of my family and my kin and my friends. Um, and I started to think about, well, who am I writing this novel for, you know? And I, you know, over our email exchange, you said something really beautiful. You said that there isn't a readership for who you can write for entirely from a place of belonging. And I thought that was so relatable just based mm -hmm. on our histories and the nuances in them. So do you, are you thinking differently of who you write for? How do you think about that question of audience when you write? Well, maybe I'm at a slightly earlier stage than you are with that because I really I'm interested in what you said that it your sense now of who you're writing for has shifted since um, Port of Being, and I, I want to yeah I, I'm I'm curious to see what will happen after um, after this um, this new stage of memoir focused writing for me hmm. but um yeah I, I definitely as you said like it um there there isn't a sort of single easily identifiable readership that that I wouldn't have to in some sense explain myself to and that's I think why there's there's meaning in our encounter you know that's mm -hmm. part of the sense of we don't have to maybe code switch as much in our conversation yeah. um and we're not, you know, we're not identical, obviously, but there's that feeling of, okay, you, you get it. And I, I remember my first few short stories early on, occasionally coming back with, um, with feedback that amounted to something like, along the lines of like, this character is unlikely, you know, mm. that sense that the things that, especially then I, at my the level of just exploring short story. I didn't feel I could write a fully white character. I wasn't inhabiting that in the world. Neither, it also felt fraudulent to write um, of um, a South Asian character who, mm -hmm. who was fully culturally immersed in that experience as an immigrant to Canada because that, that wasn't my, my story either. And, and mm -hmm. it's amazing how writing will 
It's almost like those details will just float up to the surface, you know, the things that you can't, um, you can't fake and shouldn't be able to fake. It's not that I wanted to not be mixed mm -hmm. and multi-religious and multilingual in my writing, but it was that it seemed what was what's normal to me and what is what I live seemed like that word unlikely or, or contrived in some way to uh, mainstream readers or editors at, at that time. And I think that maybe that's gone in two directions now. Like on the one hand, I, I have a little more confidence as a writer in, yeah. in my imagination or my ability to convey what I don't live as directly but also it's almost become natural to just write from where I'm at and who I am and what I am and then sometimes the uh, feedback that comes through my writing group is exactly on the subject if you know if you're writing towards potentially towards white readers here this part needs explaining but if you don't feel like doing that or that's not your intention here then it doesn't we're able to give each other that sort of feedback and that then it's a consciously weighed decision right. rather than an accommodation made because that's, you know, what's, what's editorially acceptable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That it's so telling just to hear. Thank you for sharing that, by the way, just that you received that comment about the characters being unlikely. You know, I also, I get similar comments in, in sort of bigger institutional settings, you know, about mm. the characters being unlikely and also unlikable. <laughs> I think it's right. you know, this trope of like the good immigrant, that all immigrants have to be good and polite and love the country that they're in. So it becomes very difficult to write about something transgressive, like an immigrant is also like a drug addict or a thief or something like that, you know? That's very true. There's, so, there's such a sense that we should be grateful to be here. Mm -hmm. And that is inevitably better what we've landed in. And yeah, it, yeah, I'm sorry that 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 is happening, but I think it is a reality. And ha have you seen it shift at all over the course of your your time as a writer? You know, I've um, I've I've definitely been grateful for the conversations in publishing that are happening now, which make it more easier for me to just feel more at home about being unlikely <laughs> <laughs> but I also say I've just been compartmentalizing you know if I'm gonna let's say I'm gonna send it to a journal that's very very British or very Canadian I will explain because I know that they're you know the readership might be different right. but for the novel I've been sort of just following what Rohinton Mystery did he didn't explain anything <laughs> and Right. I'm trying to do that as best as I can and then figure out the whatever explanations I might have to make later on. So I think I'm still in early stages. And I think that there's a courage to that and a, a certain logic too. I think Tiny Heathsy Coates, um, I, I think it was an interview that I heard him say to the reader, just do the work. And he said, if I'm reading a radical feminist essay that's not my world but I'll do the work I'll I'll do the you know I'll put in the effort to meet the writer at their place of understanding and um, I think it's okay to ask that of our readers to just make the an assumption in the writing that they will make that crossing towards us which is subversive in itself you know it's the opposite of the marginalized groups explaining themselves to to the more dominant group and I think that asking for that motion there's a certain dignity and power in doing that yeah mm -hmm. that's so beautiful I love that I think it would be such a good place to end do the work do the work. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah and um I I very much enjoyed getting to know your ideas and thoughts a little better and looking forward to um to your novel i really hope you find the protective space to continue the momentum thank you sadika i hope we are we continue to be in touch and i look forward to your essays very much too thank you very much me as well